<laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to close after that introduction, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you uh, this evening. I have a question. Has science somehow made belief in God obsolete? Um, has science, in one way or another, shown that those of us who believe in God are like people who believe in Santa Claus? That at the end of the day, belief in God is really belief in a fairy tale. And it can only be sustained by people who are needy and emotional and can't withstand serious, rigorous intellectual investigation. Unfortunately, a lot of movers and shakers in our culture today believe exactly that, that belief in God has been shown to be unneeded, false, and silly by modern science. For example, recently, a professor of biological science at, uh, at the Ivy League School, Cornell University, made the following statement, quote, let me summarize my views loudly and clearly. There are no gods. There are no purposes. There are no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead, and that's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics. There's no ultimate meaning to life. And there's no free will for humans either. If there's no ultimate meaning in life, it's odd that he would take the time to say so. <laughs> Apparently, he thought that that was a meaningful action. But in any case, this is a professor who speaks for a lot of people today who believe that science has somehow shown that belief in God is obsolete. Now, unfortunately, this is not limited to the upper echelons of the ivory tower. This attitude, and many of you have bumped up against this as you've tried to share your faith with people, this attitude is filtered down into the general culture. A few years ago, Time Magazine featured a cover story on how the universe will end. When you look at the story, it basically says that for centuries and indeed millennia, human beings have wanted to know how all this would end. But unfortunately, the article goes on to say, the only way that human beings had of answering their questions was through philosophy and religion, which basically amounts to nothing more than idle speculation. Now, for the first time in the history of the human race, Time Magazine tells us, science has finally moved into this area of investigation, and for the first time in our history, we have finally obtained real, solid answers to our questions about how the universe is going to end. Do you understand the attitude that is expressed towards science vis-a-vis -vis theology and philosophy in the Time Magazine article? The idea is that science is the only guide we have to knowledge of reality, and religion and theology and philosophy really amount to nothing but idle speculation. And in a world where more and more people believe that, it will be very, very difficult for them to take the gospel seriously. So I ask you, is this true? Is it really the case? that science has somehow made belief in God unreasonable and indeed obsolete. To those of us who profess belief in Jesus Christ and in the existence of a supreme being do so, largely by an act of blind faith uh, or an expression of personal feeling, is it really true that science has made belief in God obsolete? It will come as no surprise to you that I profoundly disagree with this sentiment, and I would like to give you four reasons why in the next few minutes that we have together. I want to share four reasons why I think it is not true that science has made belief in God obsolete. Number one, the claim that science is the only way we can know reality, as Time Magazine put it, cannot possibly be true because the claim is self-refuting. Let me say that again. The claim that science is the only way that we can know reality cannot possibly be true in spite of what Time Magazine says, because the claim is self-refuting. And you say, explain that. What does it mean for something to be self-refuting? What does that mean? Well, it means that it basically makes itself false. For example, 
The sentence, there are no sentences in English longer than three words, is self-refuting. The sentence itself is longer than three words. So the sentence refutes itself, or the statement uh, made uttering the sentence. Uh, The statement, I do not exist, is self-refuting. The statement, I can't speak a word of English, uh, is self-refuting. The statement that there are no truths is self-refuting. And the statement that there can be no knowledge of reality outside the hard sciences is not something that can be known through the hard sciences. In fact, if you think about it, the statement, we can't know reality outside the hard sciences, is not really a statement of science, it is a statement about science. Turns out it's actually a philosophical statement that says that we can't know philosophical statements. Let me illustrate this. Years ago, I was speaking at an evangelistic event in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was told that there was a very vicious atheist uh, who was a, had his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and been an engineer for 30 years, really hated Christianity, and a person was going to bring his boss uh, to this little evangelistic gathering where I was going to be sharing my faith. Well, I was at the hors d'oeuvre table before the event got going, and I saw this gentleman walk in the door with his boss. And sure enough, they made a beeline to the hors d'oeuvre table, and uh, this, this uh, friend of mine introduced me to this gentleman. And no sooner did we exchange pleasantries when he said, well, I understand that you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best shot. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he said, I used to be interested in that myself when I was a teenager but I've outgrown it now because I realize now that if you can't test it and quantify your data and measure it in the laboratory, it's nothing but a bunch of idle speculation and hot air. You ever heard anybody express that attitude? A lot of people have that attitude. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I let him go for about another two minutes. And then I interrupted him and said, excuse me, but uh, I have a question. I'm a little bit puzzled. If I understand you correctly, if you can't quantify something in the lab and test it scientifically, then the assertion is nothing but idle speculation, a bunch of hot air. And he said, that's absolutely right. He said, I've believed this for a long time. And I said, well, you've said 30 or 40 sentences uh, that have come out of your mouth in the last two minutes. And of the 30 or 40 things you've said, I can't think of a single thing that can be tested scientifically. (laughs) I said, if I'm wrong, would you show me which statement you've made that is scientifically testable? But if I'm right, you see my dilemma? (laughs) What you've been saying for the last two minutes is nothing but a bunch of (laughs) Well, he changed the subject very quickly. But, but the point is that when people tell you that science is the only way we can know things or it's the only thing that's true, uh, that statement can't be true and it can't be known to be true. And so statements like this are false. Science, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful gift from God, and I'll say that before I close again. But it is only one way of knowing reality. It's important, but there are many ways to know reality outside of science. And the statement that science is the only way we can know reality is not itself something that can be known by science. And it is a self-refuting claim. That's point number one. Point number two, 95% of science is completely irrelevant to Christianity. And 95% of Christian doctrine is irrelevant to science. You see, the vast majority of what scientists do have no relevance whatsoever to the Christian religion. I can frankly care less whether water is H2O or H3O. It doesn't bother me insofar as I'm a believer. Um, The chemical composition of a methane molecule, uh, the nature of igneous rock, uh, uh, igneous rock rather, igneous rocks. That would be a theological issue. (laughs) Of igneous rock. These are, these are areas of, the, of science that have little or nothing to do with, the, with Christian theology. On the other hand, debates about whether all the spiritual gifts are still available today, or debates about how to understand the Trinity, 
or debates between Calvinists and non-Calvinists over whether Christ died for just the elect or whether Christ died for everybody are matters of little interest as far as chemistry, physics, neuroscience, and geology are concerned. You have to understand that the overwhelming percentage of the issues dealt with in theology and in science have little or nothing to do with one another. And so 95% of science is just not of interest to a Christian theologian and conversely. So not only is the claim that science is the only way of knowing reality self-refuting, but the idea that somehow science is showing that the Christian religion is false or superstitious fails to appreciate the fact that virtually all of science has little or nothing to do with Christianity. This is a very, very important point to make. This is why those of you in this room that are engineers and scientists can go about most of your work without being too concerned about what you're doing as far as you're a Christian is concerned. Because if you're doing an acid-base reaction in a chemical lab, you're going to do it the same way a non-Christian scientist does it, and it won't make that much difference. <laughs> now, there is about 5% of what science claims that does interface directly with Christianity. 95% of it doesn't. But there's about 5%, a small percentage, of the, of the um, beliefs that scientists hold as scientists and the beliefs that thoughtful Christians hold that relate to one another. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that a large number of that 5% that we discover in science has actually lent support to, to the belief in God. Far from undermining belief in God, a large percentage of this 5% has actually lent support to belief in God. Let me give you some illustrations. First of all, we now know, beyond reasonable doubt, that the universe began to exist. Now, by the universe, I just mean the sum total of space, time, and matter. We now know that the material universe, the, the, the sum total of space, time, and matter, have, have, has not been here forever, that the universe began to exist. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we know this, but let me give you one just that I think might be the simplest for us to grasp here this evening. It involves something called the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, that means a system such that there is no energy and no mass that can come into it from the outside, that in a closed system, the amount of useful energy is constantly being used up. The amount of useful energy is constantly being used up. Um, for example, this, this, this would illustrate it, uh, uh, it's not an entirely accurate illustration, but it will do, I think, for our purposes. If you came in here and you saw a coffee cup sitting up here and you came up and touched the coffee cup and it was still warm, you would know that that coffee cup had not been sitting here for 50 years. As a matter of fact, you'd know the coffee cup had not been sitting here probably for more than 30 minutes. Now, why is that? Because if left to itself, the coffee cup is going to do what? Yeah, it's going, to, it's going to cool off. It's going to use up all of its heat energy. And all that useful energy, that, that energy that could be used to do work, this is called, for those of you in science, this is called entropy, that this useful energy is going to dissipate and it's going to be used up. Now, the universe is like that coffee cup. As a matter of fact, in the Time Magazine article, it basically says that a day is going to come far into the future when all the pockets of heat in the universe are going to be entirely cold, that all of the sources of light in the universe are going to burn up and there will no longer be any light that's generated anywhere in the universe, and that the universe is going to slow down to, to where it will be quiescent or motionless, and that the universe will use up all of its heat energy, all of its light energy, and its motion. Now, do you see what this implies? If the universe is using up its heat and its light and its motion, and if the universe hasn't used that up yet, 
it follows that the universe has not been here forever. Because if the universe had had an infinite past, if it had been here forever, what would have already happened to the heat and the light and the motion? It would have already been used up. Since it hasn't been used up yet, that means the universe could only have been running out of energy for a finite period of time. And if this is the present moment right here, then back here is the past. That means there was a beginning to the whole show. And from that point on, the universe has been running out of energy. It is as though the universe, as one scientist put it, had the entropy or this useful energy put into it from the outside in the very beginning. Or as Ted Koppel said on Nightline once, it looks to me like bangs have bangers. <laughs> I think that's a reasonable thing to believe. Now there's a lot more that can be said about this, but I can remember when I first became a Christian having a lot of non-Christians tell me that the universe has been here forever. It's always been here. You'd say, well, who, who, caused the, who, who created the universe? The answer was nobody. Why? Because it's always been here. It never had a beginning. Well, that is not a reasonable thing to hold any longer because now we have good reason to think the universe has not been here forever, that it began to exist. And one piece of evidence for that is the scientific discovery made years ago about the second law of thermodynamics. Indeed, Lord Kelvin and some of the early discoverers of, the, of entropy were quick to draw the conclusion that the past had to be finite or else the universe would have already used up all of its energy. So the universe is like a, like a car with gasoline in it. It's using up its fuel, and since it hasn't used up its fuel, it couldn't have been running out of gas forever. Now, I may run, run out of gas before this is over with, ladies and gentlemen, but hopefully <laughs> the universe won't do that. All right, that's, 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 that's the first area of confirmation that science has lent support to belief in God, that the universe had a beginning. Here's a second piece of evidence that science has lent support to belief in God that was persuasive to the atheist Anthony Flew. You know Anthony Flew was probably the leading intellectual defender of atheism for something like 50, count them, 50 years. And no one would laugh at you if you said that he was the intellectual leader of the atheist movement for practically half a century. A few years back, he became a believer in God. He's not a Christian yet, but he now believes in God. And the piece of evidence that I'm about to give you was one of the pieces of evidence that was persuasive to him. I have a friend that I teach with who did his doctorate in philosophy at Oxford University. One day he was walking down a lecture hall uh, at Oxford, and he, and he walked past a door where a famous British uh, philosopher, Anthony Kenny, was lecturing. And Kenny was actually lecturing on this piece of evidence. And he heard Kenny, the famous atheist, say, frankly, I really don't know what to do with this evidence. This is tough for those of us who are atheists to deal with. And it's called the fine tuning of the universe. The fine tuning of the universe. What scientists have discovered is that there are a number of physical factors that if they were slightly larger or slightly smaller by a billionth or a millionth of a percentage point, no life could appear anywhere in the universe. Let me say that again. They've discovered a large number of physical factors such that if any one of them was a little larger or a little smaller, on the order of a millionth and sometimes a billionth or more of a percentage point, there could be no life anywhere. Let me illustrate this. The charge on an electron. Scientists have been able to measure how much negative charge is on an electron. What they didn't know was that if that charge was just a little bit larger or just a little bit smaller, there could be no living things anywhere in the universe. They've made the same discovery for the mass of a proton. They've made the same discovery for the, for the strength of gravity in the universe. If the strength of gravity were just a little teeny bit weaker or just a little teeny bit stronger, there could be no living things that were biological in the universe. 
The same for the rate at which the galaxies are expanding away from one another. If it were a little bit slower or a little bit faster, there could be no living things anywhere in the universe. Now think of it like this. Suppose that you were able to walk into a room and you knew that this room was, miracle of miracles, a universe generator. That this room generated universes. And you went into the room and you looked and there was a panel with a whole 30 or 40 dials on and that each dial was about this big. And each dial was colored black and had about 5,000 settings, but there was one sliver of a setting that was colored red, and the other 4,999 settings were black. And you looked at all 30 or 40 of these dials, and you noticed that every single dial was set to red. And you also discovered that if any single one of those dials was in the black area, the universe that it generated would not be able to sustain life. It would only be if all of those dials were precisely set in the red area as opposed to the black area that life could be permissible in the universe that's going to be generated by this room. Now that is what we have discovered. We have discovered that life-permitting universes or universes that will allow life to be present in that universe require the numbers to be very, very delicately tuned and selected, such that if any one of them had been a little larger or a little smaller, you get no living things whatsoever anywhere in the universe. And as one British scientist said, it looks like the dice were rigged ahead of time. <laughs> and I may be simplistic, but I say again, it looks like rigged dice need a... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I feel a lot of love right now. <laughs> There's a third area where science has lent support to belief in God. And this involves the discovery of biological information. Biological information. The first piece of evidence I gave was the discovery that the universe began to exist. And as my evidence, I cited the second law of thermodynamics. The second piece of evidence that I gave from science was the discovery that these factors of nature are very precisely, delicately tuned and balanced so life could appear. The third factor, which I'm going to cover right now, is the discovery of biological information. How many of you saw the movie Contact? A number of you. It was a movie featuring Jodie Foster, and it was about SETI, S-E-T-I. Jodie Foster was a SETI researcher in that movie. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence the search for intelligent life in outer space. Now, um, you would assume, and this would be a correct assumption, that if we were going to look for intelligent life in outer space, we would have to have some way of knowing when we, recognize, when we discovered it, would we not? Now, what scientists have done is they've drawn a distinction among three things. Randomness, simple order, and information. Now let me illustrate. Suppose I had alphabet soup, and I tossed it up in the air, and I suppose that this alphabet soup had English letters and it had numbers in it, and it's scattered all over the podium here, and here was an upside down T, uh, a, a, a square root of minus one, uh, a, a, a T laying on its side, and a 3.5, and so on. This would be random. Now, if you want to tell a computer to generate a random sequence of letters, you would give the computer two instructions. Number one, select any letter, and number two, repeat. Do you notice how simple that is? How many instructions is that? It's only two, and notice that you would tell the computer to select 
a specific letter? No, to select any old letter and repeat. So randomness is nonspecific, and it's very simple. It's very simple to produce. Now contrast that with simple order. Suppose that I had 500 MEs in a row, ME, 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 and so on. Now this is not random, is it? This is ordered. Now how would you tell a computer to generate uh, this string of letters? Well, you could give it three instructions. You'd have to tell it when to stop. But apart from that, you could say, select an M, select an E, and repeat. Notice number one, this again is very simple. It would only take three instructions to tell a computer to generate this. Randomness was two. This is three. That's not very many. Secondly, it's specific. You would tell a computer to pick an M and then an E and then repeat. So it is specific. Note third, it is repetitive. You have a little unit that's repeated over and over and over and over again. Now, number four, this is a little harder to grasp, but the parts are prior to the whole. Now, let each part be an ME. How many parts do we have? We have 500, because I suggested we have 500 MEs in a row. So what we have is 500 little parts where each part is an ME stuck together. Now, which came first? Not the chicken or the egg, but which came first? The individual MEs or the entire string of MEs? Which, which came first? It's pretty obvious that the individual MEs came first because the whole is just a string of the individual parts. Does that make sense to you? Now note, if we took an ME out, suppose we came up and took number 75 out so that we had 1 to 74 and 76 to 500, we just had a little toothless gap right there. Now, if we took number 75 out, would ME 276 sitting down here care? Would it make any difference to this ME whether 75 was there or not? No, it wouldn't, because it would have no knowledge. Uh, I'm speaking um, figuratively here. But it would still be sitting there fine, just as it was if we pulled one of these out. Now, that means that the parts are prior to the whole. If you can remove a part, and it doesn't do anything to the rest of the whole that's, that's essential, then the parts are prior to the whole. Now, the third kind of configuration would not be random, and it wouldn't be simple order, but it would be information. And an example of this would be John Loves Mary. Now, notice to tell a computer to generate John Loves Mary, it's, we first of all have to get specific, print a J, print an O, print an H, print an N, print a space, M-A-R-Y space, and so on, L-O-V-E-S, and then Mary. Number two, it's, it's not simple, but it's complicated. Instead of two or three instructions, this would take 15. If it were the Gettysburg Address or the Book of Romans, now we're getting up to a lot of instructions. Number three, it's not repetitive. Notice that in John Loves Mary, you don't just have a little unit that's repeated over and over and over again. And number four, the whole is prior to the parts. Now, there are different ways of expressing this, but basically the whole would be a thought that I would have that I could express in English or in German. And once I have selected the right English sentence, that sentence is adequate if it expresses my meaning. Does that make sense to you? Now, what if I took a letter out of it and replaced it with another letter? Suppose I had John loves Mary, took the M out and put an H in there and have John loves Harry. <laughs> what we have, ladies and gentlemen, is a completely different W-H-O-L-E, a whole, an entirely different whole. If I put the square root of minus one in there, we'd have gibberish. We'd have noise. We wouldn't have a real sentence. Now, the important point about the SETI research is that they make the following assumption, which I believe is a reasonable assumption, and here it is, that information can only come from an intelligent mind. So that if they discovered a signal from outer space that was random or was simple order, as Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact, 
it would not cause any suspicion. But in the movie Contact, I believe, she discovered a signal that contained, if I'm not mistaken, the first 20 prime numbers in a row. Now that is not random, and it's not ordered, it is information bearing. And she immediately drew the conclusion that this signal was not produced by randomness or by the laws of nature, but by an intelligent agent. Why? Because information only comes from intelligent mind. Now what sauce for the SETI goose ought to be sauce for the DNA gander? And the single most important discovery that biologists have made for decades is that the bodies of living organisms, a frog's body, is different from, an, from a crystal because a living organism is constituted by information. And we talk about DNA and the genetic code and so on. Now, if somebody were to say, yes, but given enough time, and given millions and billions of years, and given the laws of nature, we, we could generate a DNA molecule, then the same argument would, could be used to shut down the entire SETI project. Because any time we discovered a signal from outer space, like the first 20 prime numbers in a row, someone could always respond by saying, well, don't draw the conclusion that that came from an intelligent agent. It's more reasonable to think that given millions and billions of years and the laws of nature, that natural law and randomness would produce that. But no one would draw that conclusion, would they? And it's hard for me to believe someone would draw the same conclusion when it comes to the information in a DNA molecule. So the origin of the universe is backed by the second law of thermodynamics. The fine-tuning of the universe I illustrated with the panel and the dials, and a rigged dice seemed to require a rigor. The third is the information that is found in DNA, and scientists themselves assume in the SETI project that information comes from an intelligent agent, and that's the most reasonable explanation of it. And then finally, the origin of mind or consciousness. Consciousness and mind exists. Indeed, I would assume that there's a lot of consciousness going on in this room, even as I'm speaking. <laughs> At least this is my hope, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Indeed, my hope is there's as much going on now as was going on 25 minutes ago. But in any case, <laughs> consciousness is real. Consciousness is mental. Consciousness is disgustingly invisible. You can't see, touch, taste, smell, or hear a thought, a belief, a desire, a, a, a sensation like an emotion, or an act of will. I remember years ago uh, when my daughter was uh, in elementary school, uh, we were having a little prayer time, and she said, Daddy, if I could see God, it would be easier to believe in him. And I said, honey, the problem is not that you haven't seen God. The problem is you've never seen mommy. She said, what do you mean, dad? Because mom was sitting right here. And I said, well, if we could take mommy's apart cell by cell without hurting her, <laughs> and we could, and there are times I've wanted to, but that's, oh, don't look so pious. Don't look so pious out there. And I said, if we could take her apart cell by cell, you, you, we could find pieces of mommy's brain. We could say, hey, there's mom's heart, or there's her lungs. But we would never run across anything in her brain or her body where we could say, so that's what mom really believes about the Kansas City Chiefs, <laughs> my favorite team. Or, or Mom does like the color red better than the color blue. Or mom is feeling sad, there's her sadness. And guess what, honey? We would never come across any cell in mommy's body where we would run up against her eye or herself. Because mommy's consciousness and her eye or self are spirit, they're not matter. They're invisible. And so at least mommy is small enough to have a body. God's too big, so let's pray. 
I gave each of my children $5,000 worth of therapy their senior year of Biola, <laughs> precisely because of these kinds of incidents. Now, here's the problem. If you start the universe with matter, and all you do is you take matter, which, according to the description of matter, since what is called the mechanical philosophy in the 17th century, so since the original atomists, Locke, Newton, Boyle, and others, our scientific description of matter is that matter does not contain consciousness or the potential for consciousness. So if you start with matter, brute matter, and all you do is rearrange it according to the laws of chemistry and physics, guess what you're going to get? Rearranged matter. You're not going to get mind squirting into existence because that's to get something from nothing. That's to get something from materials that don't have the potential to generate it. Now, because consciousness exists in us, the most reasonable explanation for the origin of consciousness is that the universe begins with a conscious being. If the universe begins with brute matter, there will be no explanation for the origin of consciousness. Why do I not believe what this scientist at, 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 at Cornell said? Why do I not agree with Time Magazine that science has made belief in God obsolete and our only way of knowing reality is through the hard sciences? Number one, I think that claim is false because it's self-refuting. Because this, the idea that we can only know reality through the sciences is itself something that can't be known through the sciences and would have to be a bare assertion for which no reason could be given. Number two, most of science, thank God for it, has nothing whatsoever to do with religion, and most of theology has just nothing to do with science. There's a small area of overlap. Is that area regularly and systematically hostile to the belief in God? Heavens no. I've just listed four areas where scientific discoveries have lent support to belief in God. Are there areas of difficulty? Yes, there are. There's evidence for the theory of evolution. And, and it's hard to square some parts of this theory of evolution with the early chapters of Genesis. Again, there's evidence for an old universe. Now, I happen to, to, to favor an old universe, but for those who hold to a recent universe and, and the days of Genesis are six 24-hour days of creation, that's a problem. Again, we haven't found a lot of archaeological evidence yet for a universal flood of Noah. And there are other archaeological discoveries that have called into question certain teachings of the Bible, though in my opinion the vast majority of archaeological discoveries have supported the Bible. But are there some that are problems? Yeah. And my response is, so what? What follows from that? That science as a whole is against belief in God? No. What follows is we've just got more work to do, that's all. So what I want to say is I want to set the record straight. Science is actually a friend of Christianity, not a foe. And science came from within the framework of a Christian worldview that made sense out of the assumptions of science. Science cannot be the only way we can know reality because the claim that it is cannot itself be known by science. Most of science and most of theology have little or nothing to do with each other. In the small area where they overlap, are there problems? Yes. But what follows from that is we just have more work to do, that's all. But is it always in that small area against belief in God? No. There have been major discoveries, and I've listed four of them for you, that have actually lent support to belief in God as opposed to being contrary to belief in God. Now, if you're interested in more of this, I brought a CD set called The Case for Christianity that's available. I would also encourage some of you to sign up for the Christian Apologetics Program at Biola University. It is an extremely good program run by Dr. Craig Hazen. If you would like some more training or you know somebody who would be interested in this kind of thing. But let me just say thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, this evening for inviting me to come and speak on the question of whether science has made belief in God obsolete. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that science is a wonderful, wonderful gift 
that we don't need to be afraid of it. Indeed, we need more believers to go into science. We thank you for it. We acknowledge that the vast majority of what science has discovered is not directly relevant to what we believe as Christians. And we acknowledge in that small area of overlap, while there are problems, there's a lot of room for rejoicing as well. So Lord, help us in our work and help us to learn how to be more effective in setting the record straight. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.